did Stanley Plotkin, the father of vaccines, admit that they lied the whole time? No. No, not even close. But why are anti-vaxxers saying that he did? That's what I'll explain in this video. Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to day two of debunking week, where each day this week I'll be making a new debunking video covering a vaccine claim that I missed in the past month or two. So a few weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, a few scientists published this piece, Funding Post-Authorization Vaccine Safety Science. And one of the authors, Stanley Plotkin, is considered to be one of the fathers of vaccines by some people, I guess. He is a really smart guy. He's done a ton to contribute to vaccine science, and he's an amazing scientist in general. The information in this video is piggybacking off of yesterday's video, so if you haven't seen that, go check it out before watching this. We know that after a vaccine is rolled out into the general population, it enters what is called phase four or surveillance studies. This is a time when indefinitely surveillance will be done on the drug or vaccine to make sure that it is safe in the general population. It's during this time that we're going to detect rare adverse events if they exist. In other words, this is when those 1 in a million or 1 in 100,000 cases are going to occur if they do. This is really important because this allows us to make better decisions on the risk benefit of the drug or vaccine and allows scientists to go back and fix those problems if they present themselves. But these post-licensure studies take money and resources and time. So what these authors are suggesting is that there should be earmarked funding or funding set aside by Congress that's specifically for these kinds of studies. The authors argue that this would make the science go faster and more efficiently so that we could more quickly identify these problems if they occur. The authors also argue that more timely and efficient study of vaccines after they roll out to the general population can help dismiss anti-vaccine concerns. And just to be clear, the authors suggest that this funding comes from the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which is a program funded by pharmaceutical companies. The funding comes from an excise tax placed on the manufacturers of vaccines for each vaccine that they produce. So they're suggesting that this money comes from Big Pharma. And the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program is at a consistent surplus each year, so it has extra money lying around. So the authors are basically saying, why not have this money from Big Pharma fund more studies? That, in a nutshell, is what this piece is asking for. Just more funding for the studies that are already being done to make them faster and more efficient. Is that how anti-vaxxers read it? No. <laughs> Some of the things that anti-vaxxers have said about this piece is that it admits that vaccines are not robustly studied for safety. Okay, I guess they didn't read it. I mean, they say this right in the paper. For example, though there were eventually more than a dozen well-documented epidemiological studies that led the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, to conclude that measles, mumps, rubella vaccines, and thimerosal in vaccines were not causing autism, the results were not available until years after these possibilities were raised publicly. So right there, they're naming an example of post-licensure study of MMR vaccines after a bunch of people claimed that they were causing autism, which they don't. And just pointing out that the studies could have been done faster and the results made available sooner. But the people who are sharing this article saying that the father of vaccines is admitting they lied the whole time, also are people thinking that MMR vaccines and other vaccines cause autism. Still, in 2024, they still think that. That includes Robert F. Kennedy Jr., just so you know. This is clearly an attempt by anti-vaxxers to completely misinform you about a paper that unfortunately is behind a paywall. So they assume that you're never actually going to read it and they can just say whatever they want about it and you'll believe it. But you're smarter than that. I know you are. Some other things that anti-vaxxers claim this paper admits is that pre-licensure clinical trials have limited sample sizes and follow-up durations, that's a quote from the paper, is a reversal of what has been claimed about vaccines before. No, it's not. It's always been that way. I already talked a little bit about this in the beginning of this video and in yesterday's video. In case you can't tell, debunking anti-vaccine misinformation involves a lot of repeating myself because anti-vaxxers always say the same stuff and they never come up with anything new. But just to be clear, this has always been the way it is. Clinical trials are not sufficient to show the full safety profile of any drug. It's just not. You would need an impractical number of people in your clinical trials to get a statistically significant signal 
for those rare but real adverse events. That's why phase 4 post-market studies are done. I will also just hit on this claim about inadequate follow-up time. When it comes to certain drugs that you might take every day, follow-up time in a clinical trial can be important. If you're taking something every day, maybe you're fine with it for the first few months, but maybe after that, there might be some new effect that the drug is having on you that might not be desirable. That's a perfectly reasonable concern to have. But with a vaccine where you only take it a few times and have months or years in between your doses, that's not as reasonable. We know for a fact that every single adverse event following a dose of a non-live vaccine has happened within eight weeks of that person receiving the dose. There is no scenario where someone receives a non-live vaccine and suddenly has an issue from that vaccine a year down the road. There is just no reasonable biological mechanism for something like that to happen, and there is no example in history of something like that ever happening. Phase 3 trials are going to encompass those first eight weeks after a given dose. So when it comes to vaccines and vaccine safety, follow-up time is not really an issue. What's really important for vaccine safety is when you give it to more people, because again, that's the only time you're going to notice those real but rare adverse events. And those phase four studies are done all over the world by several independent groups, all getting the same results, that vaccines are very safe and very effective. This piece is just asking, can we make that process better, more efficient, and more readily counterable to anti-vaccine claims? And the fact that anti-vaxxers are taking this opinion piece as some kind of win is all the proof you should need to know that they don't read. That's going to do it for day two of debunking week. As always, all of the links to all of the science that I talked about in this video are linked in the description below so that you can check it out for yourself. And I'm even going to include screenshots of the paper that's behind a paywall so that you can check that out too. And of course, don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me tomorrow where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then. Thank you.